you're watching the evolution of this politician and you're thinking to yourself, this guy needs to run for president. So you write him a letter. Yeah. What'd you say? I can't memorize it. I, I, I have it in a book. <laughs> There's a book over there if you want, I'll read it. Yeah, that'd be great, actually. I had wanted to write you a long letter explaining my reasons why I thought you should make a run for the presidency this year. But that's too late. I read in the Irish Times this morning that you made a hard announcement and that small hope is gone along with others that have vanished in the last four years. I suspect that all nations have their historical moment, some moment when it all seems to have been put together as an idea. Our moment was 1960, 1963. I don't think it's nostalgia working or romanticism. I think most Americans feel that way now. The moment is gone now, and we have grown accustomed to living in a country where nobody would protest very much if Jack Valenti replaced John Gardner. I wanted to say that the fight you might make would be the fight of honor. I wanted to say that you should run because if you won, the country might be saved. If we have LBJ for another four years, there won't be much of a country left. I've heard the arguments about the practical politics which are involved. You will destroy the Democratic Party. You will destroy yourself. I say that if you don't run, you might destroy the Democratic Party. It will end up nationally the way it has in New York, a party filled with decrepit old bastards like Abe Beam and young hustlers with blue hair trying to get their hands on highway contracts. It will be a party that says to millions and millions of people that they don't count, that the decision of 2,000 hack polls does. They will say that idealism is a cynical joke, that hard-headed pragmatism is the rule, even if the pragmatists rule in the style of Bonnie and Clyde. I wanted to remind you that in Watts, I didn't see pictures of Malcolm X or Ron Karenga on the walls. I saw pictures of JFK. That is your capital in the most cynical sense. It is your obligation in another, the obligation of staying true to whatever it was that put those pictures on those walls. I don't think we can afford five summers of blood. I do know this. If a 15-year-old kid is given a choice between Rap Brown and RFK, he might choose the way of, us, of sanity. It's only a possibility, but at least there is that choice. I give that same kid a choice between Rap Brown and LBJ, and he'll probably reach for his revolver. Again, forgive the tone of this letter, Bob, but it's not about five cent cigars and chickens in every pot. It's about the country. I don't want to sound like someone telling someone that he should mount the white horse or that he should destroy his career. I also realize that if you had decided to run, you would face some filthy politics and that there are plenty of people in the country who resent or dislike you. With all of that, I still think the move would have been worth making, and I'm sorry you, you decided not to make it. Signed by me. And then I learned later that um, Frank Mankiewicz, who was Kennedy's press secretary and others, told me that he carried the letter around and showed it to various people, you know, particularly before making the decision to finally run. In all your talks with him, did he ever express his own apprehension, his own fear that he too might be assassinated? Never. Never. 
You think it was in there? He just didn't talk about it? I think it was in there. Because when I saw him that night, um, after he'd been shot, he was lying on the floor still. They still, the ambulance hadn't come yet. There was a kind of look on his face that was, I knew this was going to happen. A kind of fatalistic look, this, this is it. Whether he was thinking that, nobody knows what he was thinking. Was he conscious? He, his eyes would open and close and open and then stay there. And there was a kind of smile on his face. So he, was, he must have been somehow partly conscious because he got shot right in behind the ear uh, and had blood on his fingers from once it, because he was turned this way. We were all walking backwards, coming down the corridor into this kitchen area. And there were like three steps. And I'm, me and other reporters were watching him come at us when the first shots ran out. We turned to look. And it was after Kennedy reached the top of these steps, turned to shake hands with Juan Romero, and bang, 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 bang. Not loud, but because it was only a 22. It was like, pap, 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 pap. Five shots. And some of them, because uh, Rosie Greer and Plimpton and uh, me for a little bit, and uh, Rayford Johnson all grabbed, struggling for the gun, and some of the people behind Bob Kennedy were shot in the legs down below, still coming towards us. Because it all happened so quickly. And when I looked at him down there, I knew it was over. <laughs>